this is the Messier catalog, especially if you're starting out in, in astronomy, the Messier catalog is something that you should definitely know about. And it's always worth having a look at. So the Messier catalog is named after this dude, uh, Charles Messier. This is a painting that my boss did and he said, don't ask me how many hours it took me to do this painting because I will not tell you. But yeah, this is a little digital painting that he did. And Charles Messier was a comet hunter. He was inspired uh, as a teenager by the great comet of 1744. And supposedly this comet was extraordinary. It had this enormous striated tail which spanned about a quarter of the night sky. Um, when he saw this, this is what inspired him to go on and become a comet hunter. But we're talking, you know, mid to late 1700s. And the telescopes of the time, yeah, they're good. They're magnifying things. They're not that good. And unfortunately, he kept coming across an awful lot of not comets. So, yeah, fuzzy things in the night sky, which he knew weren't comets because they were static. They would not move against the background stars. And so because he kept coming across these not comets and wasting all of his time, he thought, right, I will compile a list. And so if I ever come across these not comets, and I think it's a comet, I can check my list and then I know I'm not going to waste my time. I can carry on looking for comets. He did actually find 13 during his life. So he was pretty successful at finding comets. And because he had, you know, Great optics of the time, compared to today, pretty terrible. It means that the Messier catalogue is a collection of the most accessible, the brightest objects of the night sky. And they're full of all different things. You've got, you know, spiral galaxies, you've also got elliptical galaxies, there are star clusters, there are globular clusters. There's also one double star, and then there's also a group of four stars, and they're the kind of oddballs that stick out from the Messier catalogue. And there are also nebulae, you know, this is a, an example of all Hubble images of things which are in the Messier catalogue. You've got you know, the Ring Nebula, you've got the Orion Nebula, there's, you know, all sorts of things going on. And I think everything can be seen with a pair of binoculars under dark skies, so you don't need good equipment to really enjoy the Messier catalogue. Uh, he didn't have light pollution, did he? That is true, and uh, <laughs> we do, but... <laughs> No, under dark skies though, with a pair of binoculars, you can spy all of them. I thought we'd just take a look at some of his original sketches. So this is his, um, on the left, you've got his original sketch of the Andromeda galaxy. And then of course, this is a very good amateur astronomer image of Andromeda, our nearest neighbor. And as you know, I think it's pretty good actually. You can see he's got the satellites in there as well. Although he's labeled it as a planetary nebula, I think. But yeah, it's, you know, is surprising for his time. And then this is the Orion Nebula. So this is his original sketch on the left. And then again, a nice Hubble image, I believe, of uh, the Orion Nebula. And you know, he's got the dark dust here. Well, I'm always going to talk about the dust, Justin. And you can see the bright, you know, at the core where you've got the trapezium stars <laughs> right in the center. You know, he's captured a lot of these, captured that odd bright star, which is down in the bottom right hand corner. Where did you get the sketches from? The internet, but I will tell you exactly what I think I got them from uh, Wikimedia Commons. But yeah, they're on there, I think. I mean, did he, did he publish a book of his own sketches, did he? He did. Well, so he published papers. The first Messier catalogue was published in 1774, and that had only 45 objects. And then um, he did a few more iterations of um, his catalogue. And by the time he died, there was actually only 103 in the Messier catalogue, but today's Messier catalogue has 110 objects. And those final additional seven objects, they came from people beginning, I think, in the 30s and then going up to the 80s, looking back over Messier's notes and his assistant's notes and all of his correspondence, and where he's kind of noted that these extra objects existed, but he never found time to formally observe them and then publish them in scientific papers. So. Purists are like, oh, it's only 103, we should do the last seven. But, you know, the last seven has some of the most iconic objects in it, like M110, which is one of the satellite galaxies of Andromeda. Most people just know it as M110. So, yeah, I always go with the 110 for the Messier catalogue. But, yeah, he published scientific papers about it. And then some crazy people, me included, sometimes try and attempt a Messier marathon. And this is where you try and see 
all 110 objects in a single night of observing. And there's a very narrow window once a year where all of the Messier objects are above the horizon at some points between dawn and dusk. And it is a dawn to dusk observing event. And the window is uh, beginning of March down to the beginning of April. You always want to do it when there's a new moon. So whenever the new moon falls within that. And when you're doing the Messier marathon, you have to start as soon as it gets dark and you have to get the very first object. So you're chasing constellations like Cetus and Pisces before they set. And then you slowly work your way westwards across the sky as the night progresses. And then the very last ones you're trying to kind of catch before the dawn takes them away. And uh, my dad and Alan, we managed 66 over the course of camp. So yes, very, very pleased with that. Yeah, I'll take that applause. Go Sorry? We go to our manual. Oh, we go to, because I want to enjoy observing, not wasting time finding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh yeah, with a go-to. I would. I mean, I won't make it ever into any record books because to get into the record books, you have to do it manually and you know proper old school. But um, yeah, if you ever do want to attempt a Messier marathon, um, it's quite difficult for us because we're uh, you know in the UK, sort of 50 degrees latitude-ish, and he was observing from France, so we, uh, everything was a bit higher up in the sky for him. But you can also do it from the Southern Hemisphere. Lots of the Messier objects are available to Southern Hemisphere users. If you know you ever got any friends down there and they're saying, oh, I can't do the Messier marathon, they lose the most Northern objects, so they won't get like M81 and M82 and so on. But yeah, they can definitely get most of them. These mountains don't help. Yes, yeah, that was our problem. We lost a few because of the mountains. So yeah, when you're doing the Messier marathon, you want a nice clear Is there a record for them needed? So the, the Messier Marathon was invented in the 70s, I believe, by three American astronomers. They kind of twigged, oh, actually, you could do them all in one night. But the first completed one, I didn't, don't think it happened for another 12 years, because that's how difficult it is. Because, you know, you get a patch of cloud the last two hours, you might lose a bunch of objects, and then that's it, you're, you're done in for. So it has been done. I'm sure that there is a list somewhere of people who have, you know, officially, successfully stuck to the rules, whatever they may be, and have done it. It's, but it's um, also very difficult to find an observing site where you've got, you know, totally flat horizon, you know, yeah. Yeah. virtually nowhere. Is there an order to do it, or do you just go 1 to 110? It's a really good question. So you, you have to go in the order that the constellations are setting. Because the numerical order is just Messier over, you know, years of observing. He was like, right, that's another one. There's not really any logic to the numerical order. It's just the order he discovered them in. So you have to go in uh, starting off with Cetus. So you've got M77, then you do M74. You want to hit Andromeda and Triangulum. So you want to start on this side of the plot. And then you have to slowly work your way uh, towards the west. And then as we discovered... You can hit all of these loads of galaxies in Virgo. You can sort of get about 15, just bam, in Virgo straight away. But then you have a sort of two hour gap where you have to just wait for constellations to rise. And that's where we stopped because it was like, oh, it's like minus seven and we have to wait until 3 a.m. to catch any more of them. But Alan stayed up and got an extra nine. So he did. He did very well with that. And um, yeah, and then you just got to try and get the last of them then before the dawn steals them away. So it is quite exciting. It's, it's really good fun. And there are, of course, if you just go online and type in Messier Marathon, there are lists which tell you the correct order to go in. And so, yeah, that is Charles Messier. That is Messier Marathon. And that is the end of Astronomy 101. Can I ask, um, does mm. Messier's telescope still exist somewhere in a museum? <gasps> I don't know. That's a really good question because I have tried Googling like, oh, what did Messier's telescope look like? And I cannot find any images of it. So, yeah. Do you have steel mirrors? Sorry, say that again? Steel mirrors in his telescope. I don't know. I think it I think it was a refractor. Yeah. I mean, he had several telescopes over the years. Yeah, several telescopes, but the one that he was using to do the Messier catalogue uh, was four inches, I believe. But of course, four inches of 18th century optics. So, you know, binoculars and very small telescopes of modern optics are more than up to getting the Messier objects. Tube lengths must have been incredible for four inch objects like that. Just yeah. like Just a giant, giant like tripod holding it up at one end like this. Like, right, assistant, move it. 
but they were these like some of the old telescopes from like you know the old pioneers they weren't even telescopes they were a lens on top of a tower and then another lens further down and that was the telescope they didn't bother with all of the struts and then they just would move the the lenses until they were getting a nice focus and then just slowly rotate things and to move across the sky it was god they did some mad things when astronomy was starting out a, um, gentlemen astronomers in this country would have their own sort of batman so they would go to an yeah. observing site and set up my telescope for me my good man thank you very yeah. much yeah so if anybody wants a job, yeah. <laughs> do you not have one, Justin? Uh, yeah. <laughs> is there a reason we set this thing up? Uh, right then, there we are. All done.